Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is going to be a sort of literary theme uh, discussion uh, video. Uh, I was inspired by a relatively new uh, Booktuber called Bob the Bookerer who um, one of the things he does is uh, he looks back at uh, past booker uh, lists, I assume the short list rather than the long list, uh, reads them all and then talks about them sort of having chosen a year and personally I can't wait till he gets to 2010 and the travesty of uh, there being three fantastic books there on the short list Room by Emma Donoghue, In a Strange Room by Damon Galgut and Sea by Tom McCarthy and yet they gave it to um, Howard Jacobson's uh, Finkler's something uh, which seemed to be in a war for his career rather than that particular book and uh, it sort of um, rather did my interest in the booker so I can't wait for uh, Bob's 2010 uh, book a roundup. Um, but what I'm actually responding to is uh, two videos he made on experimental fiction of which he is a fan and which I have to say is is my wheelhouse as well both as a reader and a writer. And I have talked about what makes experimental fiction in the past but it was sort of the inspiration of, of how Bob had presented it that, that sort of has helped me organise it in my mind as to how to present this. So I've broken it down into categories of experimental features um, and there are books that I've attached to illustrate those. Uh, not every single experimental book is covered. Um, these are just ones that I am in possession of and have read. Uh, I will say though before we launch into this um, I don't like the, the, the label experimental fiction. I don't like it as a reader and I don't like it as a writer because it seems to be experimental is a pejorative word of something half finished or the, the author didn't know where it was going to end up. It was a, you know, it was a leap of faith, you know, um, you know, casting out a line and see, see what you hooked, which, you know, to me are both nonsensical arguments because um, if a book is published, that means the author, editor and publisher have deemed that it is finished. It is good enough to be launched out into the ocean of readership. And, you know, you don't have to know where, where the book's going to end up when you start writing it. There are plenty of non-experimental uh, writers who, who operate like that. It's called Seat of the Pantsy, where they haven't got sort of, you know, wall charts of plots and flow charts of action and graphs of character and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so that seems to be nonsensical. Then, you know, just how many elements, you know, so-called experimental elements or what we call conceits, make up a book to call it experimental and, and we'll come across that in some of the books I talk about. You know, is a book with one or two uh, sort of experimental elements, does that make it experimental? I think this is where there's a confusion between experimental fiction when people actually mean unconventional fiction, fiction that doesn't follow the normal novel conventions. And then third of all, it's, you know, if someone does something genuinely, you know, radical, uh, it's been done. It can't be done again. Uh, it's no longer experimental when other people follow that sort of similar trail. And again, we'll, we'll sort of come to that. So an experimental book only seems to, you know, be a one-off, a unique thing. It can't be replicated and still be experimental. So these are all reasons I have a problem uh, with the concept of experimental. But having said that, uh, as many uh, of you who follow my channel know, the so-called experimental <laughs> genre label is is exactly uh, where my main interest in, in literature lies. So let's start talking about some of the elements that may make something experimental or not. So the first thing to say is it, you know, it probably came into uh, sort of coinage with the modernists like Joyce, like Virginia Woolf, like T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which really represented a radical rupture with the Victorian novel and poetry that had come before. Um, and the, you know, these were all done in the sort of first two decades of the 20th century. So again, you know, given that they laid down most of the possible experiments with literature, is it even useful to still be trailing that label, you know, a century later? And also what they've done, while experimental and daring for their time, has, has now, you know, rolled out in many novels, again, that aren't particularly experimental. So, for example, The Stream of Consciousness, which is one of the categories. Um, there are lots of novels that do Stream of Consciousness and, again, are not particularly 
um, radical with it. Uh, then you know they can be you know quite commercial books really. What it just means is you're inside the head of the narrator, and the narrator is sort of uh, written with a sort of without a filter in terms of lots of diverse thoughts and perceptions are being written about. They're not they're not sort of handled in a sort of artificial arranged organized way. It's it's literally reproducing all the thoughts of the narrator. So you know. That in itself, that's one of the elements, and for me, in and of itself, it is no longer experimental, as I say, because lots of books do it, and it's kind of been done to death, although when we get to it, I will pull out a recent example of a book published that I think gives it, uh, pushes it in a new direction, ple rather pleasingly. Although, you know, I said that about Joyce and Elliot and Wolfe, but it's actually worth pointing out that at the dawn of the novel, uh, Tristan Shandy could really be viewed as an experimental novel because it's a novel like no other of its time and before the rules of the novel had really become firmly established it had gone off in its own direction but you know it's it it's sort of reductio ab absurdum to sort of reduce Tristan Shandy and put it in an experimental category. Okay so on to the individual features themselves and the first is one of my least favourite actually as a reader and that is intertextuality so that is where lots of literary allusions or direct quotes um, are culled from other uh, previous works and woven in, hopefully seamlessly, into the text. So, you know, an obvious example of that is The Wasteland. Uh, again, Joyce's Ulysses is rich with sort of literary quotation and allusion, obviously, to the Odyssey itself. Um, but slightly more modern versions, uh, The Recognitions by William Gellis, which I'm currently reading in a buddy read, has an awful lot of uh, well-readness uh, in it. Like Joyce, um, a lot about religion and a lot of classical illusion, which is why I'm not a big fan of, of intertextuality myself, because I can't spot them, because I wasn't brought up in a, in a Christian household, and my reading is mainly 20th century uh, and beyond. So, I, you know, a lot of the... I have very little reading in the classical canon. I didn't have a classical education. Uh, so a lot of that just right over my head. So the sort of the, the, the game for the reader to spot the references doesn't really set my, uh, my heart a pulse. Um, I, you know, both Gaddis and Ulysses reading with, with notes by other people to supply these literary references because it can, you know, a, a apply some helpful insight. But if I wasn't reading them, I'd be getting, what, 50% of, of out the books that I am. So I'm not a huge fan of them. But there are other ways of doing cut up, uh, of doing um, intertextuality. And one of them is William Burroughs' uh, cut-up method, which he and Brian Jason used in his early novels, like Nova Express and The Ticket That Exploded. And there they were taking uh, different texts, cutting them up and pasting uh, texts together, repasting them together so that you had two texts that were not the same. And Burroughs' theory of that was that um, the ghost of the original text would echo in what you're currently reading in his text. Now, again, I never really got that because I wasn't aware of the original text that he was cutting up. So that, again, didn't work for me. But a version of the cut-up, which does absolutely vote, uh, work for me, is this, Cobra Lingus by Jeff Noon, who takes us through... He actually reproduces what he calls the source text, and he takes you through all the different manipulations of the text to get to an end text but each of those individual stages texts they're all they're all sort of work in and of themselves they're, they're not experiments in the sense of their half form no they're complete and it's a brilliant journey through the cut-up method and works far more successfully because you can go back and trace how words have been shaped and twisted and manipulated to become other words or put in other contexts and it's a very visual it's a very visual book as well. It's things like that. And things like that. So when you've got an apple made up of words with a chunk taken out of it. I talk at length on this in the Paper Trail podcast. I'll post a link to that. Uh, another book. Uh, this is called One. This is a, a collaboration between Blake Butler and Vanessa Place, both of who have individual books uh, on this list. 
uh, and it's put together by Christopher Higgs. So Higgs wrote to them both separately saying, can you write me a text and I'm going to splice it with a text written by the other. So, and um, Place and, and, and Butler didn't know what their text was being spliced into, they had no idea. It was only Higgs who, was, who, brought, who brought the text together. Now I have to say this is quite unsatisfying, doesn't work. So I suppose this is an experiment that doesn't work for me. Now it doesn't work uh, because actually I was quite interested in one of the texts on their own, I would like to have read that. Um, but does it mean that, you know, this method can't work again? No, it can. You know, you might have to slightly shift the parameters of what you're asking of the two individuals in their isolation to produce. Uh, Higgs was sort of quite open-ended, really. He gave them a theme. But other than that, I think if you slightly, were slightly more specific, it might be more satisfying. Um, OK, so that was the, that's the first, uh, the first element, which is intertextuality. The second is language itself. Now, the obvious uh, one of this is Finnegan's Wake by Joyce, which I haven't read, so I can't talk about it in any detail. But my favourite uh, is The Age of Wire and Stream by Ben Marcus, which would get into my all-time top five books. And this is a book where you read it and the words are recognisable, but they make no sense in how they're arranged next to each other in the sentences. And gradually you realise uh, that through this strange poetry, that it's an alien perspective, I mean, literally an alien perspective, a non-human perspective, who has access to our glossaries and dictionaries, but can't translate that into the, what, they're, the, you know, what they're seeing in front of their eyes and they're trying to describe in these words. So they have no natural sort of idiomatic understanding of language. And that's why it is so odd. And yet it reflects back on us, the human race, just the oddness and alienness of what it is we do day to day. And it's, it's fantastic. So this is all about the perspective, mangling language or using language in a way it's not meant to be used, used for. So that when you come to a book like uh, Room by Emma, Don Emma Donoghue, which also has fabulous language, this sort of imagined world created by a, secret, by a sort of um, consensual language of five-year-old child and mother, because they're both in captivity and they're sort of trying to shield the ugliness of the, of the real world that holds them in captivity with this magical world that they're creating. And it's at the time, obviously, you know, because the child was born into captivity. So the whole world is being defined to the child by the mother. And it's all done through the language. So what is different between, say, that and the language here? Because the Emma Donoghue book, I think, is not experimental. It is a perspective book, but so is this. I've described it as a, uh, the perspective of the alien but I think the point is you, you, you have to work out the, the perspective for yourself here, whereas Emma Donoghue, it's clear what the perspective is. It's the pers perspective of a five-year-old child who's been fed carefully filtered words and vocabulary by his mother. Um, so, it, you know, it could be moot. Maybe they are both experimental. I and mean, there's no doubt in my mind that that is experimental. Uh, you may feel that Ruby is experimental and ought to be included. Personally, I don't, but, you know... It's the toss of a coin. Uh, the next one is um, Motherless Brooklyn by uh, Jonathan Lethem, which is, uh, again, I suppose a perspective book. And in a way, you, you could sort of say, well, if Room doesn't get in, neither should this. Because this is a book about a character with Tourette's. But the word explosion, similar to this, word detonation, surprising words appearing on the page in front of you, through the conceit of a character with Tourette's just, I think, makes this experimental. But I will say that behind that is a very conventional detective story and nothing experimental. It's purely at the level of language. So again, you could say Lightroom, this has astounding language, but is not experimental because the, the, the plot and everything else is quite conventional. OK, so three, stream of consciousness. Well, I've already talked about how, you know, it's a very common uh, thing used in literature today. Therefore, is it even experimental anymore? And I'd say, well, no, it probably isn't. But about a month ago, I read this little scratch by Rebecca Watson, which is about a woman who has uh, suffered a sexual assault in her workplace, but is still there because she hasn't been able to tell anyone about it. Uh, so the guy who assaulted her, who is her boss, is still working there as well because he hasn't been you know, fingered for, for a crime. 
and obviously there's a lot of tension and stress and she's just trying to get through the work day but the way it's done is it is a stream of consciousness but what I like about this is the layout of the page represents the cascade of thoughts because we are not single thought at a time people that's not how humanity works our thoughts bombard us, they override one another so that you miss some of them. Some thoughts trail off, some thoughts you miss, you can't quite catch, you just see the sort of the wake of them. All that sort of stuff is, is produced here through the layout of the page, and I think very successfully. And as a writer, I'm always chasing after reproducing how human beings think, uh, not how uh, human thought is produced in the vast majority of novels, which is in a linear fashion. This was terrific. Is it entirely new? Well, no, I mean, non-linear representations of human thought can appear in stream of consciousness, such as in the last chapter in Joyce, Joyce's Ulysses. Um, but the combination of that with the space, spatial representation of it, I think makes it effective. So I wouldn't say this is unique and original. I'm sure that other books have done it too, but it's a very pleasing, all the way through, it pulls that off. Four, other non-linear ways of thinking. Uh, well, obviously, I've, I've talked about Little Scratch. Um, another one is The Damned United. And this sort of overlaps with language, really, because this is the takes you right inside the mind of a human being like no other book, even like this, because it is so concussive. It's rhythmic, there's repetition, there's obsessional thoughts, there's playing over um, things over and over and over again, both a sense of trapped behaviour in the sort of Freudian sense, stuck behaviour, but also in, in, in making the same mistakes you get to the same different versions of the same problems and trying to think them through. This is a superlative treatment of a human psyche uh, in a way I haven't I haven't really come across. I have in theatre interestingly but not, not in, in, in literature and Peace does this a lot and again I talk about it on my Paper Trail podcast uh, that I did and I'll Again, I'll post the link to that. OK, the next, uh, number five, I've got architectural stroke layout. So obviously there's the layout of Little Scratch. The classic one of this, of course, is uh, Mark Danielewski, House of Leaves, which, uh, so there's lots of different elements of text on the page. And that's because this is a, an architectural book, both in terms of it is about a strange house that's bigger on the inside than the outside in sort of TARDIS fashion. Uh, so it's the architecture of that house, but it's also about hu the architecture of the human mind, because there's a lot of framing devices leading up to uh, the exploration of this house. And uh, they are disturbed minds with mental illnesses such as schizophrenia. And the architectural nature of this book, of its language, it's pointing up to the architecture of the mind, both where the mind is in full working order and where it's not in full working order. So this is very much a geometric novel due to its layout. And then in the same vein, there's a book by Raymond Federer called uh, T Federman called Take It or Leave It, which I don't have. It's a come to my mould outbreak, which also is very spatial and is quite metatextual, which is another theme that I'll get to in that it's an author making a journey across America and he keeps changing his identity uh, and slipping in and out of other, other, because he's basically sort of gone AWOL from his military uh, division. And there's a lot of spatial stuff there, but unlike Daniel Lewski, where it's absolutely key and crucial to the themes of the book, I couldn't see the point of it in the, in the Federman. So for me, any literary conceit that you employ must be absolutely embedded in your in your text as to why you're employing it and for me it wasn't uh, in Federman so for me that book was a failure and a lot of the, the, the you know the books that are experimental don't work that's not because they've not been thought through properly or they are genuine experiments that didn't yield pleasing results it's just the decisions made by the authors didn't work for me okay so uh, six uh, reality stroke perception so um, the first book of that is uh, Lucky Pierre by Robert Coover, which is not a great book. I mean, it's set in the world of pornography and there's an awful lot of description of more and more phantasmagoric sex scenes. 
Um, but the interesting thing about the book is the world, as described here, only exists on celluloid. The city in which all the action takes place is only exists on celluloid. And that's a really interesting sort of um, caesura in, in one's own perception about reality and fiction. Um, as I say, an unsuccessful book, but that aspect of it was really interesting. Uh, and then another one is uh, literally geometric. It's even in the title. Uh, I seem to have filed it in the wrong place. Um, yeah, here we are. So this is called Geometric Regional Novel by Gert Jonker. And is the description of, um, of uh, a small village which is very bureaucratic in how it's run by the local council and, and the geometric elements of describing uh, things are, uh, like, you know, that's how, how it looks. The rules and regulations of this village are, are quite geometric to, sh to pinpoint the bureaucracy, to show up the bureaucracy. Uh, and another book I don't have, um, I think I unhauled this rather than it's coming to my mould, it's by Joseph McElroy and it's called Ancient History, a paraphrase, where the whole book was about, uh, I didn't get through it, what I read seemed to be about, it was about sort of people's physical proximity to each other somehow described the action of the book and, and their relationships, which I just couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't plot it basically. I have a very poor uh, sort of visual uh, sort of spatial awareness sense. I'm in the bottom 5% of the UK when I was tested at school. So for me to be able to take words to plot geometrical relationships, I find incredibly difficult. And I just didn't get on with that book. Uh, and another one, which I'm currently reading, called Platts, a novel by John Trefray. So this is uh, a sort of sensory overload. It's, it's all about physical description of place and one's emotional and sensory relation to that. And every page has this structure. Three paragraphs, every page finishes at the end of the third paragraph. So they're like building blocks, but it's suffused in, in sensory, almost overload. It's, it's an extraordinary piece of work. Um, I think that's all I've got for uh, architectural layout. Uh, again, obviously, House of Leaves. Uh, sorry, not architectural. I think that's all I've got for um, reality and perception. Other than to mention um, Alan Rob Grier's novels like Jealousy, where there's almost no human beings in the novel. The whole novel uh, is plotted by changes in light through the house and different objects on the table or, you know, be it uh, a glass, is the glass full, is it empty? Are there three places set for dinner or two? Because it's about a guy looking in from outside through the blinds into his own house to try and catch his wife in an affair with a, a visitor they've got staying with them. That's why it's called jealousy. But it's all done through this guy trying to plot, you know, he never sees them directly together, but trying to plot it through everyday objects and, and their position in space and the light and everything. Now, that seems to suggest, well, why did I get with that and Joseph, and I didn't get with Joseph McElroy? That's just how it was. I, I could follow it in uh, in, in Rob Grier's. Um, so some of these things work and some don't. It's very personal and subjective when it comes down to it. Um, so the seventh is time, uh, brackets, memory. So obviously Proust or Remembrance of Things, time sort of opened this particular can of worms. And every novel ever written involves time, if you think about it. You know, the author has to make a decision about the time scale and the time in which the novel is set. And even if you write a book, you know, set in your own contemporary time within a generation, it's already in the past. It's, you know, it's, you know, it's history. So time is a very important thing for any author to consider. And it's obviously manipulated a lot in time travel novels, um, such as... Um, uh, what was it called? The space, uh, the space traveller's wife, or whatever it was, that Audrey Neffen, Neffenigger uh, novel. Um, but the, the the one I want to talk about specifically is uh, the Unfortunates by B. S. Johnson. Looks like a book, doesn't it? But it isn't. It's a box. It's a box which has a, a lot of sort of pamphleted chapters. And one is specified as first, one is specified as last, but you can read the rest in any order. And 
thereby it, it's messing with the, the the time in the in the narrative because if you read them in a different order you get a different set of time flow in the narrative and it's brilliant uh, ostensibly it's about language rather than time interestingly uh, it's a book about uh, a guy who's going to report on a football match as a journalist and going back to a town where the match is happening where he was a student and lived uh, had a, a sort of a best mate who died of cancer so it's about sort of grief and memory and language's inability to properly bear the weight the emotional weight of it and right at the end of the book we get his football match description which is the banality of language you know how many ways can you describe a football hitting a net you know it's a it's a stupendous piece of work but it messes around with time so that now with all this sort of digital uh, books and you know choose your own way through and things like that it's not original bs johnson beat you to it by 40 years Someone may have beaten B.S. Johnson to it, for all I know. I just haven't read it. So that's my point about, you know, I think this is a, a truly experimental book. Uh, and anyone who does anything similar is no longer experimental because Johnson's done it. But, of course, it may not be a truly experimental book if someone else did it before him. OK, so fiction itself, which uh, it seems a sort of a strange uh, concept. Um... This is not a novel and other novels by David Markson and this could also fit into the intertextuality because this is a book entirely made up of factoids, quotes uh, said by anyone who was any, ever anyone in the, in the history of the world. So politicians, musicians, artists, poets, uh, critics, um, sports stars, etc, etc, etc. But they're so artfully arranged that there is a narrative. Uh, there is a flow through the book. It is a page turner. It's so subversive in that way. So first of all, this is a book, this is a novel, a fictional novel, that is made up entirely of uh, stuff said by real people. Uh, second of all, he claims in the title that it's not a novel, but because of the inclusion of the critics, the reader and the critics will decide whether this is a novel or not. And me personally, this is absolutely a novel. So that the author loses control of it once it's out there in front of an audience. This is so artful about the nature of art and legacy that you leave behind after you die and about fiction itself. Because uh, in one of the other novels, uh, including this trilogy, um, there's a fact about Jean Genet. And I know quite a bit about Genet because I'm a big fan of his. And I queried that fact. It said, it said basically that he was a collaborator with the Nazis in France. And I have found no evidence for that to be true. So everything that you take as true in here, uh, offered by Markson, you have to then go and reconsider. Actually, maybe maybe they're not. Maybe some of these are made up. So, you know, it just this is my favourite book of all time because it just endlessly works on you. It, it's so subversive. Um, and the next one is This Is Not A Novel, uh, sorry, is uh, Cambodia by Brian Fawcett. And this is about fiction and non-fiction because every... So, if I find a chapter... Right, so every chapter is a short story above the line. And below is sort of Fawcett narrating the history of Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. So you've got this mixture of fiction and non-fiction. And the subtitle of this is Cambodia, a book for people who find television too slow. And it's about the tragedy of Cambodia and other real life sort of news sort of stories and atrocities set against a sort of fictional, almost wallpaper or trivial, you know, nature of fiction set against the reality and how the two blend. A very, a very, very good read. Um, eight, sorry, nine. Metafiction. So the idea that the author uh, inserts himself into their book uh, so that you're reading the text of characters of which the author is one. So John Barth uh, coming soon, which is the last book he wrote. And it refers back to the first book he, he ever wrote, which is about a showboat on um, rivers going up and down in America, playing shows to audiences, paying audiences. But in here... Barth has a young, up-and-coming author, as well as himself, John Barth. So it's like the sort of the father and the son, or passing on the legacy of you know, sort of postmodernist writing. And it's you know it's a big, thick book. It drags at times. It's not a whole uh, a great success, but it's definitely meta. Um, 
The next one is Exquisite Cadavers by uh, Mina Kandasani, who basically, she's writing a novel and then in the side is what's happening in her actual life, real life events, such as a trip on a train and, and things like that. And at some points, the, the, the real life events bleed into what she puts down in the fictional sense. Now, again, this is not a success in my mind, but actually it provokes so much thought. I'll post the link to my dedicated video on this book and this book alone because it's a really interesting it stirs up a lot of a lot of questions about the whole nature of experimental fiction and uh fiction itself and auto fiction and things like that so i was very grateful to this book even though it didn't really work for me and then another slightly unusual one uh, this is willie masters lonesome wife by william h gas which is quite a sort of a sexy come on seduction tale um with lots of stylized spatial stuff and pictures of naked women and stuff because the book itself is the come on is the seducer is the temptress it's it the book is disguising itself in a sort of meta way uh as a as a as a woman trying to seduce the reader but actually it's a book at the heart of it that is trying to seduce the reader not not some sort of notional sexy woman it just adopts the guise or the disguise of being a woman so again very clever um 10 the unreliable narrator again like stream of consciousness this has been done to death in lots of books since um that it's no longer experimental really my debut novel had the ultimate in it in unreliable narrators um she was a a, a woman who had first been an academic's wife unhappily married because in the world of academia it was all about the uh, the professor not about the wife and she was very isolated and she was rescued from that life by a gangster who'd sort of come to give a lecture as there was a trend for uh, in the 80s and 90s in the UK of talking head ex-gangsters. Um, and he, you know, he, he clocked her at the thing he was giving and literally busted her out of university and made her his wife. But again, she was, as a woman, she had to very much fall in behind the masculine uh, rules of the world she was in. And uh, she breaks a rule. She has an affair with the chauffeur and in fear of her life, she flees and her death is fate. And she ends up on Kavos, uh, one of those sort of 18 to 20, uh, 23, whatever they are, uh, 18 to 30, that's it. Uh, sort of holiday resorts of, of you know, sex and drugs and pr uh, alcohol. And she's a bit older than everyone else there. So she sort of, and she has no, no money to her name. So she basically sings for her supper telling all these, you know, stories which may or may not be true, including being an academic at wife and being a criminal's wife. And she's an unreliable narrator because uh, I used, uh, when I was writing, although I never expressly stated it, I had the idea of a hydra, she was a hydra with seven heads, and each time you chopped off a head of her, the self that she was projecting, two new ones grew up. So she was the ultimate... Um, unreliable narrator but I didn't see that book as experimental in a way uh, another of mine that I'll come to talk about to me is experimental um 11 Olipo uh or man you know this is where you put restrictions uh, on the writing such as you have to omit certain formal elements or um such as well I'll talk about two specific ones in a minute or there's mandated writing where you know you have to follow instructions that you're given the problem I have with this is, it, is these things are arbitrary. arbitrary. It's quite hard to embed them into the reasons for these restrictions into the novel. It is possible, but most of them don't. They're just sort of exercises in style with, with certain restrictions. I don't, I don't really buy into that, I must say. So the first one of those is the famous Avoid by Georges Perec, a novel written in his native French without a single letter E, which is impressive. More impressive is Gilbert Adair, his English translator, had to reproduce a novel without a single letter E. He, she, love, um, eat. You know, so many words. I mean, E is the most common letter in the English language. So to produce a whole novel without that is a mighty impressive feat. But I have to say, a bit like Motherless Brooklyn, the novel itself, the plot and the characters, was a bit ho-hum. Uh, a more successful omission of letters, I feel, was this by Mark Dunn called Ella Minnow P, where there's an island off North Carolina 
which local government uh, has stipulated uh, one by one letters of the alphabet are removed from usage in speech or in letter writing um, and to maintain the sort of purity of of the island and those letters are as they are removed one by one they're not used in the novel it's an epistolary novel it's all done in letters and the reason for it is uh over the sort of the town hall is a is a latin uh, quote and the, for a letter drops off it um you know the, the the carved letter drops off it and they see this as a sign from the gods and of course more and more letters fall off and more and more letters are forbidden and there's three uh, levels of punishment uh and eventually the third level you get banished from the island and the hero uh, or heroine of, of this novel is someone who's trying to replace the quick brown the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog as the shorter sentence that embodies all 26 letters of the alphabet uh, she's trying to replace that with one that does it in less less letters that's the only thing that's going to save her it's brilliant but the whole point is it's embedded unlike a void where has it gone unlike a void where there's no ostensible reason for leaving out the letter e here the disappearing letters are absolute because it's about censorship it's about government sort of dictatorial behavior and it's about a, a, a sort of a race to find a, a solution to restore the letters. And then uh, this is a recent uh, novel called The Fountain in the Forest by uh, Tony White. And it has two Olipo elements. Uh, the first is that all the solutions to the quick crossword in The Guardian through May, I can't remember what year it was, each day's uh, solutions, all those words must be used within the chapter. Uh, so that's mandated writing. He has to get those words in, and they're they're highlighted in bold, so you know what the words are. And the other thing is is the use is time, because this uses the revolutionary uh, month, uh, the revolutionary calendar of the French Revolution, in here. And those two elements aside, it's a normal detective mystery thriller. So again, a bit like Motherless Brooklyn. Is it experimental enough to warrant it being experimental? It certainly uses Aleppo techniques, but only two of them. Is that enough to make the whole novel experimental? I don't think it is. I think it's a standard detective novel with a couple of these esoteric elements thrown in. Twelve, collage writing. So this is writing where there's lots of different things that, that don't necessarily follow on one from another in terms of period or characters or settings but coming together they do make a whole so I'd offer this Curtis White's Requiem which is based on uh, some classical music uh, the mass for the dead again I'm not familiar with classical music it's not my thing I'm afraid but I didn't need to know that for this to work because he's so skillful at, at the cross echoes of different of different bits that this is a really really terrific read so I don't think at the end of it you come away saying, oh, this is a book about this. But there are enough resonances and interesting ideas bouncing off each other that it was very satisfying. OK, 13, autofiction. So I just want to say at this point that I don't buy autofiction as a category. It strikes me that, it's, that the word autofiction is less an oxymoron of autobiography, which is non-fiction and fiction, the two clash therefore you know that would could be seen as an oxymoron i don't see it as an ex oxymoron i see it's a tautology because to be all writing fiction and non-fiction is based on the personal experience of the author and what's interesting in fiction is how much work the authors do on their, their personal material to distance it from, from being so subjective and personal to them to being able to be read by you know much more widely much more universally so i don't buy the notion of autofiction as, as even meriting a term to itself but having said that i will offer two books that sort of stretch the notion of autofiction really the first is the years by annie erno who tells her her life story through narrating the story of france the country that she she grew up and lived in and it's it's really the, the, the autobiography of France in which we glean things about Annie Ernaux's life. So it's quite it's quite brilliantly done. 
but I wouldn't call it auto-fiction, although ostensibly it is. And uh, The Rings of Saturn by uh, the great late uh, W.G. Sebold. This is about a walk he took uh, through Norfolk and all the sort of ghosts of things that used to be there in all these places, uh, such as, you know, the Macrolin fishing industry has gone, or grand hotels that have fallen into disrepute, stately homes that have been converted, all these sorts of things. So it's not really... It's it's stuff outside of Sabold, but it's his observations on a walk. So again, I wouldn't really say this is auto-fiction, but it is brilliant. Uh, it's it's just so... it's It has a tone and a flow quite unlike most other fiction. Uh, 14, syntactical uh, or rhythmic. So it purely relies on syntax and rhythm for these books. So the first is Zone by Matthias Ennard, which is a train trip without any full stops, which is quite increasingly a common thing. It's, uh, you know, we had that to some extent in um, Duck's New Report. Uh, but the, the way this is written without full stops is... You can almost imagine as you're reading it, this this is flowing along to the rhythm of the train tracks. That the the guy, the narrator, he's on a journey to basically hand over all his secrets as an intelligence officer for all the atrocities and all the bad guys in the whole region of the Mediterranean. But the book covers not just his contemporary period; it's the history of of these ba of all bad guys and all atrocities in the Mediterranean. It is superb, and it's all done rhythmically. I will say technically there are full stops in here because he's reading a book on this journey that's a novel set in amongst the sort of Palestinian or the Middle East resistance. Uh, that has full stops. But anyway. And another, Blake Butler. This is called Ever. It's his debut novel. And there's an awful lot of brackets. I don't know if you can see that. Some, some bits have multiple brackets. Uh, if I can just find something akin. No, something like that. And what he's doing that for is to structure again, a bit like what we were saying about uh, the architecture of the human mind and thought in books like Little Scratch and uh, House of Leaves. He's doing it purely through the syntax. The number of brackets inform you at what level that thought is operating in relation to the other thoughts that the character is having. Uh, 15. Polyphonic Voices. Uh, of course, Mrs Dalloway is one of the first. Uh, I don't really need to say anything about that. But more modern versions. So GB84 by David Peace. So we have the David Peace individual psyche of the Damned United. Here we've got a, a sort of a choral piece of all the various sides involved in the miners' strike in 1984 in the UK. So you have politicians, you have miners' trade unionists, you have intelligence services trying to sort of penetrate the miners' um, hierarchy to find out where all the trade union funds had gone because they'd been spirited away into safety ahead of the strike. It's it's very... I mean, the atmosphere is, is brilliantly done by peace. And again, there's a lot of repetition... Um, like uh, The Damned United, but it is a genuine polyphonic piece. Uh, the, the voices are genuinely different, even if within their own uh, register or their own idiom, they are you know, very repetitive. Uh, and another... This is an example of a failure of polyphonic voices, uh, or not a failure of the, of the technique itself, but... So in part one of three... Uh, this is set in a British village and all those sort of floating voices in italic that float across each other. Find another example of that where they actually do float across each other. Okay, that's another page of it. Brilliantly convey the idea of a polyphonic, you know, all the voices in the village with their own opinions and prejudices and stuff. And that's great. But then parts two and three do nothing experimental, in my opinion. Nothing at all. So this is not an experimental book, or if it is, it's a failure. And then Vanessa Place, uh, La Medusa. So this is set in L.A. And the Medusa, if you imagine the sort of snake hair, snake locks hair of a Medusa, that is... Um, a metaphor for the, the road system in L.A. Uh, and again, we get uh, polyphonic voices of characters uh, in this. This is something that I'm only part way through. I'm going to complete this year. I'm really looking forward to getting back into it. 
Uh, 16 um, is Other. So, Alejandro Zambra, uh, it's called Multiple Choice, and that's what it is. The structure of this is multiple choice questions. And what it's so cleverly doing is it's multiple choice on the recent history of Chile of Pinochet and the revolution that he uh, swept to power in and then the sweeping away or the need to sweep him away. So this is, for a Western reader, this is a really clever way of boning up on, on you know, the history of Chile. It's, it's quite satirical and subversive as well. It's not a straight history. It's done as a civil service entrance exam type of thing. Are you becoming part of the Chilean establishment, uh, you know, under Pinochet. And it's it's very, very clever, but it is a one-trick pony. And a lot of experimental books are one-trick ponies. Once you've got the conceit, it's like, ho-hum, what next? Uh, and then if I can... Uh, another book, uh, which I don't have, unfortunately, it's come to my mould outbreak. It's called Evie and Guy, and it's by uh, an author called Dan Holloway. And... It's a book, apart from its short preface, it's a book entirely without words. It's only numbers. And what you see is, uh, what you gradually realise, it's a masturbation diary. So the, the numbers are dates and the amounts of masturbation that the male in a relationship is doing. And through the ebbs and flows of that, you can, you can plot the health of their relationship. And it's very funny. It's very, it's very good. But again, it's a one-trick pony. Once you've broken the code of that book, there's nothing else it can really offer you because it doesn't have other registers and other languages with which to fill in the details around the state of their relationship. And finally, if I can just talk about uh, my own book that I would class, if I had to class it as anything, as experimental. This is called Three Dreams in the Key of G. And what I mainly... The, the, the feature that I would mainly plug it against is language. There's three female voices here in different levels of reality uh, because one of them is the human genome, you know, the, the, the DNA that makes us up. And obviously I had to invent a language for that. And I very much felt that I wanted to operate at the DNA level of, of, of language, which is the alphabet, the letters that make up words. So letters to me are DNA. Words are um, sort of proteins that DNA uh, expresses. S words that form sentences. Sentences then become a, like amino acids, and so on and so on and so on. You know, paragraphs, chapters, you know, whole texts. They're, to me, there was a biological equivalent, and I was operating at the cellular level of language, which, as I say, is alphabets. So, for the human deep genome, every paragraph had one of the uh, four chemical bases of DNA preceding it. So I don't know if you can see this. So T for thiamine, G for guanine, um, C for cytosine. And uh, these in themselves were playing word games because they spelt out words. So like ACT, A-C-T and things like that, which would give a sort of an emotional tone to that paragraph. And it was also the different genes speaking across each other. You know, the T gene, the, the, the thiazine paragraph is not the, quite the same voice as the cytosine. So all the way through, being prefigured by that chemical base letter would tone and tinge uh, the, the, uh, the language of the, of the human genome. And I do a few visual spatial things, although not, you know, not on the level of, of Daniel Lewski or anything. So there's one... And then I do things with how uh, how letters are arranged on the page. Um, having lost my uh, dust cover, I've also lost the, uh, <laughs> the the bookmark. So there's one. Again, these are all with the, with the human genome. Uh, so, so you've got going down as well as going across, and that is a sort of commentary on that. And then there was a section where I I talk about sort of Judaism and Christianity and and the sort of how they were, um, you know, their, their sort of attitude towards holy texts in terms of the scribes scribing them in sort of giant, uh, giant scriptorians uh, versus how the, you know, the Jews, uh, the Jewish texts were sort of usually sort of prescribed and they had to do it at night in secret under the light of a candle. So, um, again, they had the Christian side, there you had the Jewish side. 
there you had something where they they overlapped in the Old Testament and then the sort of word of God him herself um, so as I say to me this is a novel that operates on the level of alphabet as much as word and sentence so there you have it there are my 16 features of what makes the experimental novel and some examples uh, there were many other books I could have included, but they were the most, I think, on point for each of these each of these features. So please, you know, if you've got any questions or you want to argue with my definitions or choices of book, uh, all the successive books that I said that I didn't find successful, please come and comment. OK, big, big thanks to Bob the Booker. Please go and, and follow him. I'll put a link to his channel. Till next time. Thanks very much.